Um, thank you, Paul Clip, for having me. I'm so excited to be in Poland. It's a huge deal for me because um, both sides of my family came from Poland and uh, how we ended up in LA is a longer story, but that's not the one I'm going to tell. Anyway, I'd like to let you know that I'm going to be giving away two free books. I know not everybody uses Twitter in Europe, but these are the English versions. They cost four times more than the Polish ones and have all the buzzwords in English. To people who can actually use Twitter and tweet, you can either tweet at me or use the hashtag AceConf. And uh, here's an example of a successful one now on stage, but it could also say psychopath at Jamie R. Levy on stage, um, pound AceConf, and then I'm going to count them all up at the end. And whoever has the top two, I will message you and meet you and give you a couple of books. If you want the autograph, great. If you don't and want to sell them, um, I understand that. That's completely okay with me. So here's the deal. About a year ago, I was at a bar in Hollywood having some beers with my good friend Zahn. Now, Zahn Lee is an exceptionally bright man. He's got all the fancy degrees. He went to Cambridge, MIT, and was getting his PhD at the University of Southern California when I met him. And now he actually works at a think tank. Like, he gets paid to think. And um, he is my go-to guy when I feel like I'm not sure what my next move in is in my career, and I feel stuck. So I was telling him, hey, you know, it's been about a year and my book's been out and it's doing really well. I'm excited. I wrote this book, UX Strategy, to teach the intersection of UX design and business strategy. Everybody was talking about what's the ROI, the return on investment. So I really wanted to connect the dots and lay out techniques that were not for people who necessarily wanted to be UX strategists, but really for anyone, entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, engineers, designers who wanted to learn these techniques. And there hadn't been a book out there, so I wanted to write one. And at the same time, um, it, as it was gaining popularity because of the relevance, because UX design has now been around for a while and people were interested in the strategy, I started touring the world, getting invited to speak. And it was awesome to get to travel the world and see all these places and meet software designers, developers, and get a perspective, a world perspective on UX design and UX strategy. So, so far it doesn't sound like there's a lot to complain about, right? And I was also teaching at um, the University of Southern California. That's where I'm a professor in the engineering school, the Viterbi Engineering School. And um, it's a popular class. I'm not sure why it always fills up. It could be because the engineers predominantly who take it, although there's other students from the business school and the cinema school and the communications school that, that fill it up. But primarily, I think it's uh, engineers who want to get a break from coding and who are tired of being bossed around by UX designers telling them what to do and want to understand uh, the methodology and also understand business strategy and lean startup and user research and all the different things. Or maybe it's because it's an easy A. But for whatever reason, I'm enjoying teaching this class. So the book was a course textbook to help them along so they wouldn't have to take notes. And I felt like this. And the reason I felt like this was because here I was, this person, as Paul mentioned, someone who's been doing software design, focused on innovative products for over about 25, 27 years, and I found myself that I wasn't making anything, that I was just teaching and preaching, doing workshops and traveling. And here I was, this person who wrote a book about innovative digital products, and I wasn't doing shit. So I was bummed. I was bummed. That was my problem. <laughs> so he said to me, who are the innovators who inspired you? 
as we were trying to figure out like what was my, you know, what was it that I was thinking about, you know, could think about to where I could get onto a project that would be innovative and inspirational. I said, well, if we go back in time, that's easy. When I was an undergrad, I loved Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol, um, I, I, think, I think he actually came from Poland. He had a Polish last name that he, he changed slightly. But he was incredible because he brought pop art to the masses. He made art accessible to a lot of people who um, were perplexed by fine art. He did more than that, though. He also made incredibly weird experimental movies that were so either strange or long that people would walk out on them in the movie theater. He also had this really rad place in New York City called The Factory, where people would come together and talk and meet and take a lot of drugs and really awesome bands like the Velvet Underground would play. And so he brought together so many different people that ultimately a lot of people spawned from this, you know, these events and became innovative in um, themselves. And so then Zahn said, well, you like Andy Warhol, that's great. But how about somebody in tech? And I was like, well, that's easy, Steve Jobs. <laughs> I mean, you know, RIP. Steve Jobs, you know, made one of my first computers. He was the man who went up to the engineers and said, I want a computer that fits on a phone book. That was the, that was the, business, the technical constraint. You know, I want it to be easy to use. You know, he put things together like the mouse and, and the interface to, to basically make it so that he brought computers to the masses. And then, of course, we're all familiar with all the devices and laptops and him making, uh, being responsible for all this software that a lot of us use, including me right now with Keynote. But the big thing about him was he was able to bring with the iTunes and the App Store um, all of these different touch points, all these devices together, so that we all could use them easily. And everybody from my son to my 98-year-old grandmother is okay using one of these Apple devices. And so this was incredibly inspirational for me. And why Apple is so successful is because they always are making technology that's at least two to three, sometimes four years in the future. Doing things that everybody says impossible, like having an interface where you tap on glass. And so this is kind of, you know, really, really crucial. If we want to work on innovative products, we have to be saying, well, what, instead of thinking about what's possible now, but imagining what's possible in the future. And so this helped me think it through. And so then Zahn said, well, are there any living innovators who inspire you? <laughs> Perhaps even ones that don't wear black turtlenecks. <laughs> so I started thinking about it, you know, and I was like, shit, what the hell? You know, and it's this guy. <laughs> Seriously, I don't think I'm as cool as him, but I like to dress like my idols because I'm a poser. <laughs> Elon Musk is one of the most incredible innovators of our day. He has been responsible for so many things for such a long period of time. He was creating video games while he was a teenager. He created Skype, web-based calls, before there was such thing as Skype. He made his big money by co-founding PayPal and making transactions easy, and we're still using it today. He then took all that money he made and started investing it into Solar City, another company who co-founded, and using green technologies for the, to make life better for the common good, creating beautiful cars like Tesla, and then ultimately where he is now in Los Angeles at SpaceX. So he was somebody that I really inspired, that I was really inspired by. 
but I wasn't sure how to get involved. So Zahn told me, he goes, well, Elon just released this white paper. You know, they wrote about it everywhere. It was, this is from the LA Times. And it basically described that he gave the specs for public transportation for a high-speed transit system. And the pitch he had was that we could get from LA to San Francisco in 30 minutes for 25 bucks, as opposed to you know, taking a plane and driving six hours. And this is a big deal, because Hollywood and Silicon Valley like to go to each other's place. And being able to sit on a train would be excellent. And he was not going to pursue this idea himself. Instead, he wanted to make it open source. And this is really crucial, because it's like, here's this guy who has all these ideas, and he puts them out there, because he wants people to basically just spin on them and remix them, just like skateboarding. You know, if you ever were a skater, or a skater now still, and you go out to a park, and you see people doing tricks, and then you're like, oh, I want to try that trick, and then you do something different, and people copy you. And open source is a lot like that, where basically people are building upon other people's ideas and collaborating. And so I love that. So I looked for two or three of the companies that happened to be based in Los Angeles. And one of them was Hyperloop Transportation Technologies here on the left and Hyperloop One. Now this one was more interesting because they were using crowdsourcing, which was a big idea. This idea where people could would work together on Hyperloop, taking this idea forward from all over the world. Designers, engineers, all kinds of different people from all kinds of different, whether they worked at corporations or worked on their own. And so I wanted to get involved. So another thing why I picked HTT was because of this dude. This is Dirk Alborn. And he was all over the media. He's got a crowdsourcing platform. And he was just blah, blah, blah about user experience. So I was like, I got to talk to this guy. So I stalked him on LinkedIn. I wrote him the typical thing. Hey, Dirk, would you like a free copy of my book? <laughs> and if not, either way, I really want to work for your company. Maybe you're looking for a UX designer, UX strategist. 17 seconds later, he writes me back. It's incredible. Maybe it was automated. Everybody on the team is working exchange for stock options. We have a requirement of 10 hours per week. If you're interested, write blah, blah. And I was like, ah, oh, stock options. <sighs> you know, I was there during dot com. I had my own business, and I'd pay people with cash and with stock options. My dad would joke. He'd say, you're giving them 10%. 10% of nothing equals nothing. And I was like, Dad, Hyperloop's offering me like 0.001% of nothing. So it's even nothing of nothing. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is I want to work on something innovative. But the problem was, how does one work on a project where we're only allotted 10 hours a week? What can we really do if we want to transform the way people move around the world? So I decided to further crowdsource it to my class, two classes that were starting at USC, full of engineers, student engineers, and business students who were all psyched up to either work on their own project or a project that I brought in from the outside. And these students are studying everything from development to data mining, cybersecurity. They're very smart. And so I sent out a Blackboard notice saying, hey, does anybody want to work on this special project? It won't be any extra work, because they're always worried about like having to spend an extra minute on doing projects, you know, schoolwork, because they have a heavy workload. Will it increase my workload? I'm like, shut up. And, but you will be required to be on these Skype calls once a week, so we could work as teams. I needed um, at least 10 people 
but 20 people volunteered, and we had five concepts from Dirk. So I decided to split them up into groups, and then we would have weekly Skype calls so that we could make sure that everybody was on the same page working toward the same value proposition. And that was how we were able to pursue these ideas. So let me talk about the big picture. This is what the freeway in Los Angeles looks like. Now, you can sit in this freeway if you're a dumbass and go nowhere real slow and you can not exercise, not be with your family, not be with your friends, text illegally, which is what most people do. Basically not do anything productive except sit in your car, not moving anywhere. And that's a big problem. And I've I was born in LA and I've lived there now again for many, many years. And it's not just a problem in LA, there's traffic problems all over the world. But it's even bigger than that. This is for short journeys. You know, Hyperloop was looking to try to solve the problem even before there was a Hyperloop rail system. The big problem that Elon saw and that Dirk saw and that everybody really who's been stuck in traffic or has tried to ever travel from point A to point B, let's say from here to LA, is how, fric how full of friction that experience is, how unpleasant it is, how you have to like book like how I'm gonna get it to the airport or the train to the airport and the airport to there and this to there and getting from point A to point B, you're like booking all these different things. There's no seamless way. And if one thing goes wrong, you know, the plane's delayed or the bus breaks down or something, it's a pain, it hurts. It's a point, what we call a pain point. It's also not efficient. You know, all this data of all of us moving around with our smartphones, with geolocation, isn't really leveraging all of these data points. It's like the closest thing to it really is, is Waze, if you've heard of that, in terms of tracking people and helping them make their ride more efficient. So extend that idea of Waze using data points and crowdsourcing them to create an algorithm to make it easier to go from point A to point B, whether it's short or long journey. That was our big goal. But bigger than that was to make this journey either free or cost less. And so we had a bunch of different concepts. The first thing was we had to create a prototype for the passenger app. So the passenger app is to solve this problem. We focused first on business commuters because they're the ones that don't want to be stuck. They're the ones that really need to get somewhere and they're possibly working along the way. And they have a hard time. I always ask my students, focus first on the problem, not the solution. We all want to jump to the solution. Or we do what our bosses say, and just make the thing. Here's the business requirements, make the thing. But I said, no, we're not focused on the solution. Let's talk about what are the problems and understanding the pain points and then create a persona, not the old school Alan Cooper personas when he started out and it had, and everyone would write up all these characteristics that were specific to one person, but ones that had common characteristics that looked at, a, let's say a customer segment because we needed to go out and find these people and validate that they had the problem. Not that they wanted the solution, but they actually were, had the problem, that it wasn't just my problem or Elon's problem. And so we create these things called provisional personas, meaning they're placeholders, and then we validate them if we're lucky. And so we go to places where the people are. In this case, we went to the Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica and talked to them, the students did. I just sat at home, it's not my homework. And then they come back with findings, and I like to see validation, i.e. like at least seven, eight, nine, ten strong signal people saying, yes, there is an issue with this. And I hate it when I have to book travel and all the different things I have to do and coordinate everything. And then we move on to doing competitive research. And I'm just showing you slides of the homework assignments from the students. And basically, they, we would do methodical research, as I teach how to conduct methodical research of the competitors out there and see, like for instance, this one, you could book the entire 
end to end from A to B and look at the ones and say, who's doing the coolest stuff? And let's cherry pick, poach or rip off the best ideas and make them even better so we can have a competitive advantage. And then we have an analysis and then we start prototyping. And they each worked on different aspects of the prototype and then ultimately made one that was animated. And that's how all five of the projects work. The next one was ride sharing. And the big idea with ride sharing was that anybody, not just someone who's got a car like Uber, Lyft, but anybody, whether they have a boat or a tuk-tuk, could offer a ride and, get, and be part of the system. And so we went out and talked to, in this case, Uber drivers, because they're kind of trapped and they want a five-star rating. And so we could ask them, do you have any problems? What are the problems? And they told us things like, well, I don't know when the surges are, like if there's a zillion people coming in from the airport or there's no traffic going on now, like there really wasn't an easy system for them, or if they wanted to make more money or even get tipped, like there just wasn't that many incentives built into the system, it's flawed. I mean, Uber's great, it's made our lives easier, but it could be so much better. And there's people that have other forms of transportation that they could offer to us. And so we wanted to create a prototype that considered that. Once again, talk to these people find out that it is a problem, learn about the problem before we go out and solve it, do an analysis looking at not only the apps in the United States, but apps all over the world because we're always building upon each other's ideas. And then create a prototype. And so this prototype was about helping people, they could select whatever mode of transportation they have, and be able to decide if they're gonna to try to pick up multiple people at once, let's say at the airport, but really putting the control in the rider's lap instead of it being controlled by the people at Uber. And thinking about what that experience would look like. The third idea was this concept of an advertising platform because we really wanted to try to make some of this experience either free or as cost efficient as possible. And so we looked at what was out there. You know, we looked again, they had to say, is this a problem? And they did this, this group by talking to people who place ads that are related to where we are at that moment of time while we're moving from point A to point B. There's not much out there, right? I mean, we validated that they had a problem finding a platform. Because if we go to Facebook, we know we can do targeted advertising, but it doesn't know where we are. It's not contextual. The closest thing out there really is Waze, where if you're driving around, have you guys heard of Waze? Do you know? It's like Google Maps, Israeli company made a crazy one. Um, but it's basically using whether our passive data or active data, it's reporting like there's cops or cars on fire and then pushing ads at us that are relevant based on where we are. They're not that relevant though. Like I don't eat fried food and I'll be driving downtown all of a sudden like I'll look at the map and lost and Kentucky Fried Chicken just takes over the map and I'm like, oh, grook crash. This is not working. And so these were the competitors that there's no one really offering geotargeting that's like relevant to somebody where while they're on their mode of transportation, like, hey, watch this ad or play this game and we'll make your ride for free. But there are cool things coming out, like this bike, for example. It's just free, you can hop on it, and it just blasts ads while you're riding it to your next destination. But it's these ideas. Instead of owning a bike, we're just borrowing a bike and advertising paying for it that we are looking at for inspiration. And then the team created a prototype on what it was like to place an ad where all of a sudden somebody's commute, short or long, could be factored into the advertising to create um, a better way to do geolocation targeting for advertising agencies. The next thing we had to deal with was much higher level, and this was the stakeholders. These are the people who are in charge of Planes, trains, 
buses, whether they're actually the pilots or the managers of these systems, trying to coordinate everything when a train breaks down or a pilot of planes coming in late. You know, I, all this data is available, but rarely do they share it. I don't know how many of you have had the experience where you show up to the airport, your plane's delayed, there's another one going to the destination, you're like, can I get on to that other one? And I've never said, no one's told me, sure, go on to that other airline. No, they're competitors, they're not sharing data. They don't care about making our experience better. They just care about their bottom line. And so we wanted to just forget about that issue that capitalistic issue, and imagine if all this data could be shared, and it could be shared with the ride shares so they could see the surges and say, hey, you could do this move instead of that move and make shortcuts easier across this entire system. So in terms of the UX strategy, it, some of this experience was happening using our devices or our laptops, and a lot of it was happening while we were tran being transported off the funnel. So once again, they went and talked to, in this case, people who uh, drove trains to ask them what were the issues of, the train managers actually, who ran these systems, to understand the pain points. Now these people aren't walking around the Santa Monica Grove in Los Angeles. My students had to stalk them on LinkedIn. Surprisingly enough, there's even pilots on LinkedIn. You write them and say, hey, I've got a startup, or hey, I work for this company, or hey, I'd love to offer you a free um, you know, Amazon credits for 20 minutes of your time if I could interview you over Skype. And they were happy to oblige. And we did these 10 interviews, created a basic persona, got it validated, and then did a competitive analysis looking at all the different systems, most of them legacy, of course, because trains and planes and buses have been around, and saw that they were just so outdated and so much in need of a better user experience and far more innovative features. So there was a lot of room on this. And so the students, again, worked on the prototype and tried to imagine what life could be like if we could understand all of these different systems together and be able to map them on top of each other using big data. And then the last concept was the onboard entertainment system. So we've all taken flights and we know sometimes there's a really good one, that there's lots of movies and it's free and we can order food. And then there's other ones that totally suck and have bad content and we're pulling out our laptops and we're working and there's no Wi-Fi and it's just like, ugh. Um, not very efficient considering where we are right now in time. It can be improved on so much. So we looked at all the most cutting edge systems. You know, we talked to people who had this desire, this problem to sol have solved, like, God, I wish I could basically be more productive when I'm on these planes, or have better content. And really what it was, is being able to access their computers without having to pull out their computers and connect it. They're so, you know, you know, I was sitting on that lot, airlines, and it was like literally like on me. You know, not a very comfortable way to work. And when Hyperloop, if Hyperloop does come out, it's, we're kind of going to be bolted in there like a roller coaster ride. Like people are still concerned if you're going to be able to go to the bathroom and get up at this point because it's going 732 miles an hour. So we had to think about these technical constraints and look at the different ones and talk to people and say, what would be the best solution for you? What are you looking for? Of course, everybody wanted a better onboard entertainment system that it needed to have fast Wi-Fi and that you could um, be able to access your whatever it was, whether it was your content, your applications, whether it was to do you know, video conferencing calls. And so we looked at the best of out there because you want to know what's out there. And then they write a competitive analysis brief and then we create a prototype, understanding both the customers and what's out there in the market and trying to take it a step further, where you would sit down and all of a sudden use your thumbprint and log in and boom, there's all your apps. And you could type, write letters, do email, access your content, 
do whatever you needed to do, and it was right there in front of you. So what were the takeaways from this basically four months of working on Hyperloop for, for me and my T-sections at USC? The first thing, and this one's really personal to me, is that no matter where you are in your career path, that you always want to have both mentors and inspiring heroes, right? I mean, even as we get older, we want to look to others for inspiration. The second thing is if you want to work on innovative projects, you need to position yourself as a contributor. They don't just land in your lap. And I've been doing innovative projects for a long time. You have to seek them out, and it can't be about the money. So the third thing is that what I learned is that even with engineering students with no background in UX design, and a lot of them are international students, a lot of them are from China and India, and that reputation sometimes brings us, oh, they're not innovative, they just make, and I've been trying to break that for a long time, that they can think creatively, they can think like innovators and inventors as well. And that they could also use a UX strategy methodology to transform the world for the common good. So that was what I learned from that project. Now I want to talk a little bit about UX strategy. I think we've all heard about UX design, right? It's been around for about 10 years, it's had a lot of different stupid names. Like I think I had to change my job title on LinkedIn from 20 years ago. It was interface design, information architect, interaction designer, UX designer, UX strategist, CEO, blah, blah, blah. You know, but no, no matter what, we're just making software. It should be intuitive. At this point, in time, why make something that's unusable, even if it's for B2B? We want everybody to be efficient and it should be easy to use. And UX design is awesome because it brings in so many different disciplines, whether it's psychology, whether it's design, visual design, content, research. And so it's very rewarding to do design, but ultimately what's happened, it's become very commodified in the United States where people get hired to UX designs and the gig is, here, make an app map or a site map and do a bunch of wireframes, knock it out. You're not allowed to actually think, go out and do full on research. And so I got frustrated of being a wireframe monkey, monkey personally. And so after doing my first, what was called a discovery phase about 10 years ago, I was like, what the hell is this discovery phase, this UX strategy? So of course I, searched it up on Google and saw more of these Venn diagrams and frameworks. And I was like, these don't make any sense to me. They weren't helpful. And so I heard about this book by Andy Young. And it was called Mental Models. And it was kind of an advanced UX book at that time. And in it was the sidebar written mostly by her, and it's in this weird Shakespearean, thou ought not, evolve in isolation, blah, blah, blah. But in it was the UX strategy. It said experience strategy equals business strategy plus UX strategy. I was like, that is really weird. What does that mean? Because if you take out the word strategy, does UX plus business equal experience? I thought, no. UX plus LSD equals experience. <laughs> this thing is not enough. I want to take it to the next level. So I decided I needed to create my own formula. And because I'm a foodie, I made it plates on a dining table. And the idea was that you would eat off of all these different plates, and I'll explain them in a second. And using this, the techniques that are involved in these four different tenants, then you could then have your own UX strategy methodology along with a bunch of different techniques. So you could learn. And the big idea behind that is that you want to actually juggle these plates. Woo, house lights on. And that it wasn't about we do one and then the next one and then the next one, but that throughout, not just at the, the very beginning, we're doing strategy, that we're all being strategic throughout phase one, or our MVP, alpha, beta, phase one, phase two. 
that were constantly watching the marketplace and constantly talking to customers. So what the hell is UX strategy? Now clearly I think it's pretty punk rock because I got the Sex Pistols playing behind my definitions. And as I said, it's the intersection of UX design and business strategy. But it's more than that. It's also a plan of action. That's what strategy is. But for us, of how to ascertain that the user experience of a product is aligned with the business objectives. And that means that all of us need to understand whether it's our little business, our little startup, or we work for an agency and we're taking on clients, or we work for an enterprise, what is the overall business strategy of the company we work for? The next thing is, it's not something we just guess at, that we need to validate it, that we need to make sure that our solution solves a problem for customers in a constantly changing marketplace. There's apps coming out every day and other ones dying or websites or platforms. The marketplace is changing so fast and we're in the most hottest marketplace possible. It's on the news, we should know that, right? What are the most valuable companies in the world right now? Apple, Google, I wonder why. But the most important thing and why I like uh, UX design more than just being a visual designer, personally, is this practice of doing it in an empirical fashion, right? T thinking of it in a scientific way, not subjective, but objective. Because two of us can look at a painting and one says it's beautiful and the other one says it's ugly. Two of us can look at a uh, design of an app and say, oh, it's awesome, and the other person says it's cluttered. And so we need to be empirical in our practice when we come up with ideas and have an open mindset to experimentation. And that along the way, and so if you take agile and transpose it onto strategy, it's that's the big idea, is that we want to be validating our strategy in an empirical fashion instead of crossing our fingers and knocking out wires and hoping at the end of the day, after written a ton of code, that we made a product that has product market fit. So what is business strategy? Simply, it's the plans, choices, and decisions used to guide a company to greater success and profitability, duh, right? We need to make money, except for Paul. He's happy breaking even. All right, he's noble. So, but most companies, in order to keep us employed, need to make money. We need to care about what it, their bottom line is and how we can think about how we fit in to their system so that we can ultimately bring greater value. And so if we go back in time and look at this book from the 80s. If you happen to go to Harvard Business School, they would have made you read this thing, and it's The Competitive Advantage by Michael Porter. And he identified two forms of common ways for achieving a competitive advantage, having an advantage over your competitors. The first one is cost leadership. Yuck, right? McDonald's, well, some of you might think it's good, but um, I've had it around since I was growing up and my mommy calls it junk food. And the thing with McDonald's is now, especially in the States, there's McDonald's, there's Burger Kings, there's this, there's that. It's a race to the bottom of making dog meat into an 88 cent hamburger. It's not about quality. It's about just making something as efficient as possible so that they can make a profit. That's their competitive advantage. And so that's a little challenging for us because what if we make products that don't cost anything? Do you use Facebook? How much do you pay to use it? Nothing? Lucky. It's free, right? How about Google Maps, Gmail? Half the apps we use, most of them, they're free. So we need another way to, call, to, to beat our competitors, and that would be through differentiation. Now looking at another brick and mortar example of Starbucks coffee. Starbucks didn't start as a company that just made these wonderful lattes. It started, they just sold roasted beans. And Howard Schultz came along 
and said, I want to be part of this company, and I want to, I think that we can take it to the next level. He had just been to Milan. He walked into an espresso bar, smelled the roasted beans. At, they asked him his name, and then <laughs> and gave him this, like, crap of frappuccino thing. And he sat down and drank this beautiful latte and noticed that everybody was hanging out at the cafe. This was in Europe. You guys do that there. And in America here, and in America, it was all about like instant coffee, or you go to McDonald's or bodega, it's just like crappy coffee. We didn't care about the experience. And he wanted to transform that experience. So all of a sudden, instead of paying 50 cents, we were spending $5 on this incredible coffee. And it wasn't just getting the coffee, it was going into the store and smelling the roasted beans and listening to their crappy indie music and hanging out with all the hipsters and all that wonderfulness that Starbucks has to offer. And what this boils down to is a value proposition. A promise of value to be delivered and a belief from us, the customers, that the value will be experienced. Now even Apple has made mistakes that they've learned from, like this thing. I don't know how many of you were old enough to own a Newton, but I did, because I wanted to be the girl that could sit in Central Park and send a piece of email from her computer. But this thing was crap. It didn't have handwriting recognition like they promised. They did not deliver their promise of value. I paid $800 for that, which is $1,600 now, and it was sitting in my junk drawer four months later. Years passed, and now we have the iPhone. A lot of us have them sitting in our back pockets or in our purse or Android knockoffs of them, but it's the big idea behind them, the tapping on the glass and the apps that we can download, and they have really changed our lives in a major way. Mobile first, right? So for me, when I get a new project from a client and they're like, this is our value prop, the first thing I want to do and how I teach it is to understand who are my direct and indirect competitors. Like a direct competitor to Uber might be Lyft and an indirect competitor could be the train. But understanding who are them and looking across all of these different attributes that I know are hard to read here, but I'll give the URL at the end. I have a free UX strategy toolkit that list them all out. So you could then do cross comparisons and triangulate through analysis who are the ones that are really doing something amazing. And you could like say, who's leveraging social? Who's got an amazing user experience? Who's got the most funding? And figure out, is there an opportunity or is there not an opportunity? And if we don't do this, we're this. The mythical ostrich that's like sticking their head in the sand. How many people do you know who are working on a solution, you know there's another 30 of them out there? They're just self-indulgent, wasting their time, naive and lame, right? Why make something that already exists? We need to think years ahead if we want to make something innovative. So the next thing, my next tenant is value innovation, which is focusing on the primary utility of the product and making an indispensable part of our life. Like if, I, if someone took my phone away, I'd be so bummed. I couldn't use my Gmail, my Uber. I would be more upset losing my phone than my wallet at this point. Now this idea came from this book here, Blue Ocean Strategy. This came out about 12 years ago. And I'm gonna talk about one of their ideas, which is value innovation. But the big idea, why it's called Blue Ocean Strategy, it looks at about 120 case, business cases, everybody from Ford to Circus de Soleil, and say, how do these guys like, move so far ahead of all these other industries? It's a retrospective book. But they call it Blue Ocean because it's this idea that we come up with an idea where there's room to grow. We swim out into a nice blue ocean where we can ideate and evolve our idea as opposed to a red ocean that's full of sharks, like low cost, like McDonald's, where they're biting at our feet, tearing at us, and it's filling up with blood. We want to swim out into a blue ocean. And to do that, we need this value innovation. And the secret to that is we need to bring the cost down and the value up. And the cost could be making it cheaper or it could be the cost structure of the business. And Airbnb is a perfectly good example, and Uber. You know, of course, they're both sharing economy examples. But what makes them great 
if you think about Uber, is that it's often a lot cheaper than a hotel. And then the value's up because we get to stay in somebody's house. We have the kitchen. We can move around. We might not be in a touristy neighborhood. We have that, ooh, authentic experience. That's value innovation. And it's basically taking Michael Porter's two theories and mashing them together. So if you think about digital value innovation, what we're really doing, harking back to Indy Young's mental models, is we're trying to change people's mental models. We're trying to come up with disruptive business models and disruptive technologies to just like screw everybody up like Steve Jobs did. Screw up the film industry and the music industry and then what Uber's doing, the taxi industry and Airbnb's the hotel industry where they have to make new regulations. But so what? That's life. Okay, because whatever was happening before wasn't really working for us. And the idea of changing these mental models is tough because people are stuck on thinking in certain ways. A mental model is how we think to get, a, what we need to do to get something done. For example, hitchhiking. I don't know about you, but I don't hitchhike, right? I don't want to get in a stranger's car. I could get raped when I don't want to be. And it's dangerous, right? And then if I'm driving the car, I don't want to let some stranger like this hoodie dude in my car. Now all of a sudden, this thing comes out, Uber. And we're all jumping into strangers' cars all of a sudden, or letting strangers into our car. We push a button, and all of a sudden, Grandpa shows up, and we're hopping into his car. He is a grandpa. I'm not being ageist. And I was like, hey, Grandpa. I mean, hey, sir. Um, why are you an Uber driver? I'm just curious. This is in San Francisco. And he says, I love it. I get to meet people. I get a little extra pocket change. And I use my own hour. When I do it when I have time. And it's changed my life. It's changed his life and it's changed my life. I got to go all over Turkey last week and not get worried about getting ripped off by taxis because it was just being charged to my credit card. I didn't have to pull up my wallet. It's changed the way we think about hitchhiking because they build trust into it. We get to see the driver. We see if they have five stars. It's just like eBay and, and looking at the reviews, ratings and reviews built in to build trust. The next tenet is validated user research. And this is different than just plain old user research, right? This is something that we've learned that's become more popular from this book. How many people have read Lean Startup? Yay, good. I know you guys have because it's an Agile conference. <laughs> so he popularized this concept of validated user research and the build, measure, learn feedback loop. Now, we've seen this a million times, right? But think of it for product strategy. We come up with an idea. We build as little as the value pop as, prop as quickly as possible, and that's our product, whether it be a prototype or a landing page or even an ad on Google, just to see if people are interested. We measure the feedback with data, and we learn, and we ideate, and we go around this feedback loop. Now, he actually took a lot of his ideas from Steve Blank, who wrote The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And so I decided I wanted to change his research because I had enough of hearing this stupid word. It's a nice word. It's a really nice word. I empathize. Empathy. It's a very heavy-handed word in the field of user research. To empathize. I, I feel what it's like to walk in your shoes, assuming they're the same size as mine. But who cares about what it's like to walk in your shoes unless you're buying shoes for my company? Right? There's empathy, and then there's sales. Right? We need to make money either by people buying our products or by using them so that we can monetize them. And so we need to do this by measuring. And so I took the idea of provisional personas, which Alan introduced in his third book, because he saw that user research was being uh, basically either skipped and that he had to create a faster way to do personas and a faster way to use the research and Steve Blank's ideas of customer interviews. So instead of doing ethnography, which I rarely get to do with the products I work on, we go out and talk to our users in the middle of Africa, like we're IDO or something, and have user journeys and contextual inquiries, and instead do customer interviews. And we think about what we're trying to learn 
as an experiment, that every product that we work on is just an experiment until people are buying it, that we're trying to approach it that way, that is a hypothesis for trying to validate and get back learnings about the value proposition, about how much people would pay, and if we need to pivot or persevere in the business model. And so the way that I do that is creating prototypes, rapid prototypes. A tool I love is just in mind, but this one was just created with Photoshop mockups, jammed on an iPad to measure signal, feedback, people jumping out of their seats. And I don't go to a usability lab, I don't record people. I go to cafes where I can use them for free, give them a big tip, it's a neutral environment and the people who are in there are comfortable. It's not weird going to a co-working space or a usability lab or focus groups or being behind a two-way mirror, but instead we're sitting down showing our hypothesized customer that's been screened the prototype and asking them, is this something that you would use? And paying them actually up front, say, I'm paying you for your honesty, I want you to tell me if this would work with you and how we could make it better. And so this is really important. We show it to our hypothesized customers and then I take it one step further as I bring the stakeholder there. Now this was a startup who was trying to solve for all the issues around trying to get people into drug treatment centers in Los Angeles because they just like you go into a drug treatment center and they give you cocaine right away. And so he wanted to understand after people had spent, he spent a million dollars on his website and hadn't signed up one customer, why weren't people signing up for his, custom, for his website? And he thought it was the UX design. I said, I'm concerned about your business model. So we brought together people who had paid to go to rehab and had them come to a cafe, pre-screen them. And I said, I want you to just sit there and listen. You're gonna be my note taker, my old guy note taker. And he had such issue, he had to like cover his mouth, because over and over he kept hearing. I would not use this because I would not, I would need to know the name of the rehab before I went there. And he couldn't show the name because if he showed the name of the discounted price, then the person would just call the rehab and the rehab would give them that deal. They'd be off our funnel. But he learned over and over of all the reasons exactly from the horse's, I mean customer's mouth, why they would not use the product. That's validated learnings and ultimately he had to pivot to a B2B model. He took notes into a spreadsheet and then we were able to look at them and walk out at the end of the day with an understanding of not usability testing, who cares if someone can use the product if they're not gonna actually make it through the funnel. I mean, I'm not a simple task. I'm talking about forgetting about the usability for now. I'm focusing on would they pay for it? Is this value prop solving somebody's problem? And I also do quantitative research by running Facebook ads to fake landing pages and learning about like how can I learn about my direct channel to build to my customers to make sure they want this thing. How can I position it? And so the last thing is killer UX design. And you're like, what's up with killer? Well, I'm from California, so it's like killer, dude, killer waves. That's all. But killer really means for me frictionless, that it's easy to accomplish the goal. So that we don't have to put every darn feature under the sun on there because we know how to program it. That we just put what's on there that's necessary. If you've noticed, Uber hasn't changed. They haven't, it's the same basic app that solves the same primary use case that it did when they launched. They keep it simple, that's what's nice. We just call for it, we hop in it, we don't have to pull out our credit card. At the very end, there's no transaction, we get out. Now I understand why they don't have tipping, because it just adds another layer of complication. It's frictionless. And that, to me, is what it's all about, and why I love apps like Waze. You know, it, instead of being like Google Maps and chucking me on the freeway LA, it offers me different routes. I can see if there's like cops or what's in the way, if there's a, co a cop there who's about to give me a ticket because I'm looking at my phone. Or Tinder. That's not actually some guy I dated, that's my brother. <laughs> I don't date him, but I didn't want the real Greg to sue me. But the idea of this interaction model, this immediacy, I don't know how many of you have dated, but who wants to fill out these profiles of like, I love all these movies and all these bands and I read all these stupid books and the five things I can't live, about, live without, my air and my dogs and my kids. And it's like, who cares? 
It's like looking for a job dating, and Tinder made it very quite simple. And actually, it's not just a hookup site anymore. Um, it's a way that you can immediately, if both people swipe right, that's their interaction model, that's their killer UX, and you can engage quickly in a conversation. And that's killer UX, and we're seeing it now here in all the countries all over the world. Here's our Polish tenders, the ripoffs, but they're fine. They've actually made some of them have new features, but it's the same exact idea. You know, and they can take Tinder and bring it here and make it different. But it's all about getting people hooked, the immediacy, bringing people together, making it addictive, swipe more, see who you could get next. And so ultimately, Killer UX is about better engagement and conversion. We want to make money and we want to create happy customers. Thank you very much.